Välkomna, Tervetulua. Welcome to our webinar on nature and biodiversity conservation. My name is Charlie Gullström. I'm a researcher at RISE Research Institute of Sweden in the area of smart sustainable cities. And it's also in my role as board member for AFSR, the French Swedish Association for Research. But I'll be your host today in today's Zoomiverse and moderator for this webinar. 2021 really will be a biodiversity year. Let me share some news with you. France just last week organized on the 11th of January, One Planet Summit, the Ops for Biodiversity, in cooperation with the United Nations and the World Bank, to raise the ambition of the international community on the protection of nature. An important sequence leading up to the COP15, where new protection goals will be adopted in May uh, this year in China. And also this year in September, the next IUCN World Conservation Congress will be held in Marseille on the topic, One Nature, One Future. Once every, every four years, this IUCN brings together leaders, decision makers from government, civil society, indigenous peoples in industry and academia, to share knowledge and harness solutions that nature offers to global challenges. We all need to be there actually. Given the importance of such events and in order to boost cooperation between France and the Nordic countries, all the four French institutes, meaning in Denmark, Finland, Norway and Sweden, have joined forces in partnership with the AFSR have selected four young researchers who work in different domains and all linked with biodiversity, who will be attending this Congress in Marseille and be able to present their works. So we want this to be an opportunity to network with French institutions and also identify partners for bilateral and regional collaboration. We call them the, our laureates of the FINA Award, the French Institute Award. And the FINA Award was launched by all four French institutes in the Nordic region in 2020 to promote cultural and scientific cooperation between France and the Nordic countries and to reward outstanding achievements in this field. So today we are very proud to have the four researchers here with us. And on behalf of the French, all the French institutes and the AFSR, I'm really happy to welcome everyone to the webinar. And now we are going to proceed with presentations. Those of you who are attending um, via the different online uh, means, we ask you to place your questions uh, on the side um, in the Q&A section, uh, so not in the Zoom chat. These questions will be addressed to our four laureates at the end of the presentations. So we will have um, uh, four presentations following each other and then a Q&A session. So looking forward now to leaving the floor to Julie Strand, our laureate from Denmark. Uh, Julie's research at the Department of Chemistry and Bioscience in the Aalborg University. Uh, focuses on biodiversity and genetic diversity for species conservation by developing and improving technologies within biobanking, especially to establish and characterize viable cell lines from amphibians and reptiles. There you go, Julie. Thank you very much. I will share my screen and hopefully the connection is good. So hopefully you're all able to see my screen so far. Uh, I first of all would like to thank you very much for having me. I'm extremely honored that you chosen uh, my research uh, for this award. As Charlie said, my name is Julie. I'm a PhD student at 
uh, Olbo University. My project is a collaboration between Olbo University, Aarhus University and Ranas Reinsko, which is a tropical zoo in Denmark. I will give a short presentation on my work where I focus on biobanking uh, as a conservation tool. Um, and foremost, I would like to just give you a brief summary of the project. It's a holistic project with focus on biobanking as Charlie also mentioned. Here, uh, we've been trying to understand and improve um, the way we conserve animal genetic diversity um, by biobanking. Uh, we have been focusing on developing and establishing and improving the technologies we have today, um, but also innovating these technologies. I have focused mainly on working with um, or trying to establish viable cell lines from mainly amphibians and some reptiles. Here we have uh, done a lot of different uh, experiments in terms of testing different parameters uh, to determine the ideal growth conditions of uh, these specific cells. We've tested a lot of different media types, tissue types, uh, even differences among species and differences within a species. So to explain a little bit more about uh, what biobanking is, um, biobanking is a supplementary tool uh, to the conservation strategies that we know uh, today, such as both in situ and ex situ conservation. Uh, biobanking is, however, a method that allows us to conserve or rather safeguard genetic resources such as uh, cell lines, gametes, uh, embryos, uh, different blood products. Um, and so forth uh, by using methods such as cryopreservation, where material is stored at very low temperatures. Uh, also, uh, the material can be stored indefinitely at, um, in these conditions. So this allows us to conserve the genetic diversity within a species as well as within populations, both in captivity, but also wild populations. So we normally work with two different types of materials. And here it's listed as non-viable material, so non-living material. Uh, we also work with viable material, uh, which is living material. Um, and depending on the type of material, uh, of course, different studies and different types of research are possible. However, viable uh, material do provide the best quality. Um, and this is also what I have focused on during my research. And as I said, the aim here has been to develop and improve uh, amphibian cell lines. Um, under the different types of materials, I've also listed some of the possible research and, and study possibilities there are. And as you can see, these are, uh, it's a very broad spectra, uh, which also makes biobanking extremely interesting. So to give you an idea of how to establish a cell line, uh, the figure on the right uh, provides a very nice overview of uh, this process. Uh, as you can see, it all starts with a tissue, a tissue piece, which can either be skin, liver, heart, uh, muscle, a piece of an eye. Uh, and hereafter, we go on to um, a different kind of cleansing processes. Uh, um, to, to remove uh, bacteria or fungus or whatever we are dealing with. And after that, we place the tissue pieces within a culture flask, which is then incubated at a specific temperature. Hereafter, we wait for the cell growth to begin. And 
because we are working with amphibians, the cell growth can be extremely slow. When we are working with mammals, for example, we normally see cell growth within one or two weeks. But when working with amphibians, we sometimes have to wait until week six. And if we're even lucky that we see any cell growth. So we have run many different experiments with our cell lines in terms of testing different media types, growth factors, how we can get these cells to proliferate faster. Um, however, due to the time limit here, uh, I won't be able to go through a lot of these results, uh, but if anyone should be interested, you can always send me an email and I will try to answer whatever should be the question. So to return to why biobanking is uh, a necessity these days, um, as many of you know, we are in the middle of what we call the sixth uh, mass, mass extinction, which means that we are losing species every day at a much higher rate or at, at a much higher, higher rate than normal. And if we do continue at this rate, uh, a quarter of all our species will be gone by 2015. Um, this is why we are chosen to work with biobanking because biobanking is a tool which provide immediate safekeeping for uh, genetic material and therefore, thereby immediate um, safekeeping of the genetic diversity which we are losing extremely fast uh, these days. This is just an illustration which I found to be quite illustrative to what we are experiencing, what we are experiencing today in terms of what we are facing otherwise. And as you can see, it's quite dramatic. Um, but enough of that and the cartoons, and a little bit about what biobanking can be used for. So due to the high quality we have when working with cell lines, the usability of this type of genetic resource is enormous. Um, here I've listed some of the possible ways that the material can be used within research. And as you can see, uh, this stretches from kinship analysis to reprogramming induced pluripotent stem cells. In human healthcare and agro industries, the value of maintaining uh, genetic resources such as cell lines have long been recognized as a very fundamental component of basic scientific research. And it's absolutely the same when it comes to understanding species, species limitations, ecosystems and so on. So because we can work with uh, um, research such as kinship analysis, uh, whole genome sequences, uh, it's possible to reprogram these cell lines into induced pluripotent stem cells. For example, uh, cell lines from the northern white rhino, which is a species where there's only two individuals left uh, in the world. Here it's been possible to reprogram uh, cell lines um, into stem cells and combined with assisted reproductive techniques, it's been possible to impregnate uh, these rhinos through artificial insemination. So that's a true a turning point when it comes to saving endangered species. So lastly, I just wanted to exemplify some of the benefits uh, of biopanking. It's a, a renewable resource because we can always grow a cell line again. Uh, it provides us with a broad spectra of uh, research and studies which we can contribute high quality material for. Again today, because we are losing that many species at such a high uh, rate, 
we do need to innovate the conservation conservation strategies that we are using today. Um, and this was more or less what I wanted to tell you a bit about. I also wanted to say that um, I'm very honored again to receive this award and the possibility of attending the IUCN Congress because it provides me a very rare opportunity to share my research and these very specific uh, results, as well as giving me potential to reach out globally and hopefully create some new collaborations um, as well as having peers to discuss future strategies uh, within. Thank you and so much. Thank yeah. Thank you so much, Julie. You're very welcome. We're looking, we're happy to have you here and we will take the questions a little bit later. Yes, yes. Now, now we're flying um, to Finland where there is a lot of snow at the moment. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce our second laureate, Helena Tukiainen. Helena is a geographer from the University of Oulu in Finland uh, in the Geography Research Unit. And her research focuses on the dynamics of uh, geodiversity and biodiversity, especially their mutual relationships. And she has an ongoing iGeoBio I project that she will probably share with us and where she's exploring new empirical evidence for the relationship um, on different spatial and temporal scales. And I believe that we're also somehow now part of the night of science uh, in Helsinki. Is that right, Helena? Yeah, I'm in Finland, in Oulu, but um, virtually also in Helsinki, hopefully. And I must say that in Finland right now, the situation is such that Helsinki is as cold as Oulu. So minus 20 or even more degrees. But um, I'm happy and warm to be here right now, at least. So thank you. And um, hi and good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. and. Uh, really grateful for this opportunity that the Fred Institute Nordic Award offers. So uh, really thank you for that. So um, my name is Helena and I work as a postdoc researcher at the Geography Unit, University of Oulu in Finland. And I've been studying themes related to the diversity of nature and nature conservation since I started making my PhD in the early 2011. And currently I am privileged to work as a postdoc in an Academy of Finland funded project, which is entitled Improved Geodiversity Information uh, in Assessing and Conserving Biodiversity. So if you have any questions or want to contact me afterwards, you can send me email and find me on Twitter as well. Uh, the term geodiversity was mentioned in the project name. So have you heard it before and what does it mean? Do you know? Uh, probably not. Uh, so the diversity of nature consists of both biotic diversity uh, or diversity of the living features such as plants or animals. And in addition, it consists of the abiotic diversity or the diversity of the non-living features and these are rocks, soils, hydrology, such as rivers or lakes, geomorphology, such as eskers, dunes, and other formations, and then topographical variation. And together, they form the variety of earth materials, forms, and processes. And this means geodiversity. So it is not as much handled in the public conversation or in nature conservation approaches as biodiversity. Uh, but it is as important part of the diversity of nature as biodiversity. And in recent scientific discussion, especially during the last 10 years, it has raised a lot of attention and interest. So one dimension of geodiversity is geoconservation or the conservation of geodiversity itself. Uh, but Another dimension is to use it in biodiversity conservation purposes. So geodiversity has been put forward as a novel and useful concept to understand and conserve biodiversity. And why? 
Uh, so organisms depend on their abiotic so-called states of the environment. And the more diverse the state is, the more biological diversity it enables. So the more that there can be different actors if the state is varying. Uh, so at least on theoretical level, high geodiversity should support high biodiversity. And despite this uh, link, conservation approaches have typically neglected geodiversity. And in addition, there is not yet much empirical evidence on the real world relationships between geo and biodiversity. And um, there is a conservation strategy called conserving nature state, which has been put forward as a novel framework stating that geodiversity could be used as a course filter strategy for conserving biodiversity. So instead of tar targeting, for instance, individual species or individual habitats for conservation, the target should rather be on areas that can support high biodiversity under, under the future and even current global change. And then about the project. So there was a bit of theory, theory first and then about the actual project which are working right now. So in the project, we are seeking solutions for uh, well-targeted nature conservation and food for preventing biodiversity loss. And we are trying to find out whether geodiverse environments actually succeed in preserving biodiversity. And the topic and the outcomes of the project they are multidisciplinary, so uh, the rate related fields are at least geography, so I'm a geographer, then geology, ecology, conservation science, and so on. And the project is also international, and one of our main collaborators is assist Assistant Professor Jonathan Lenoir from France. And one of my key motivations to study this topic in this project is to find new advantages for nature conservation. And then uh, in the project, we investigate spatial, so from local to continental scale, and temporal, uh, so from 1960s to the 2010s, geodiversity, biodiversity relation, relationships in both land and water, so in terrestrial and in aquatic environments. And uh, mostly in northern environments, but also around Europe. And we are using high quality quantitative data and modern statistical analysis methods to proceed the data. So this part, um, I have, for instance, found out that there are more threatened species in Finnish national parks uh, from different taxonomic groups, such as mosses, glassware plants, lichens, where the geodiversity is high. So the geodiversity supports high threatened species richness. And in addition, I have found out that geodiversity contributes for plant species richness, especially in uh, non-human impacted environments throughout Finland. And then I have also investigated the relationship between landforms and vascular plant diversity. And this I will present more closely on the next slide with some photos in it. And um, in our ongoing research, so what we are doing right now, uh, there is a lot of going on. And here are just a few examples. So uh, we are studying if geodiversity of an area really succeeds in buffering in negative changes in species richness and composition over time. So this is an, es an essential way if we want to gain support for the conserving nature states conservation approach, which I presented a few slides back. And then we are also developing a methodology for measuring local scale geodiversity. And our aim is that this methodology is also can be also used in biodiversity research. And I will give you some snapshots of our recent fieldwork related to this methodology soon. But first, uh, I promise to tell you a bit more about the landform study. So in this study, we use data 
from uh, Rokua UNESCO Global Geopark in Finland, uh, the location you can see in the slide. And we found out in the study that landforms, they underpin plant diversity better than areas that have no landforms. And this is true on all diversity levels, so local, landscape, and also on beta diversity levels, so when different sites are compared between each other in species composition. And then we found out that moist, hydrology, climate, topography, variable landforms such as gullies, uh, Arbor Myers and kettle holes, which you can see in the photos, they are especially diverse in plants. And the results encourage both scientists and practitioners to integrate landforms and biodiversity together. Uh, then some fieldwork photos. So as I mentioned before, we are developing in the project a methodology for measuring local scale geodiversity. And this is because this far geodiversity has been mainly measured at landscape scale in most of the studies. And this method has been already built and used for the first time this summer in northern Finland and also northern Norway. And our field team visited hundreds of sites where they applied this methodology. And as you can see from the photos, they had some awesome views in there. So in short, they observed the size and wrote down the different geosites or elements of geodiversity that were present at the study sites. And the study sites are these circles that can have a diameter from five to 25 meters. And in addition to just observing, we put soil temp sensors to selected sites. They are the ones that look like a white mushroom in the photo. And uh, they are there now and will be collecting information on temperatures and moisture conditions of the sites. And we also collected soil samples that are being analyzed right now. And with this data, we are able to test whether local scale geodiversity has a positive relationship between species diversity at this plot. So really fascinating to gain the results from this. Uh, then I thought I might say some words about geodiversity and IUCN. So um, although geodiversity is often neglected from conservation approaches, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, so IUCN, has recognized its importance uh, and included geodiversity in its operations. And here you can see a few examples from it. So for instance, IUC is the founding organization of the UNESCO World Heritage Convention and its advisor on nature. And also IUCN has the long-standing role supporting the UNESCO Global Geoparks Network. And uh, the final laureates have a great opportunity to travel to the IUCN Red Conservation Congress in Marseille. And in my perspective, geodiversity is an emerging topic and many people that are involved in conservation management are not aware of it. So despite the huge potential that it offers and it, despite its importance and in the IUCN Congress in Marseille, I would have the possibility to talk about the concept of geodiversity and its possibilities. Uh, in biodiversity conservation with conservation practitioners, decision makers and scientists from all over the world and tell about the results that we have gotten in our study. And in addition, my aim in the conference would be to learn, network and gain new ideas. So I really, really wish that the COVID-19 situation will settle down and the Congress will succeed in September this year. Thank you for your attention. And I'm Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Helena. I really hope that I also will be there in, uh, in September in Marseille and that we will be there. Now we're moving to Norway, where I want to introduce you to Annabel Mempel. Uh, Annabel works at the Center for Development and the Environment, SUM, at the University of Oslo, on nature conversation in connection with international cooperation more specifically on the European Green Belt, 
an example of the connection between environmental values and personal relationships. So, Annabelle, is there a lot of snow also in Oslo and is it cold? Thank you, Charlie, for your introduction. Um, yeah, we do have a little bit of snow. Um, I live closer to the fjord, so we don't get that much um, down here, but up in the mountains, definitely. Um, let me just start my presentation. All right. OK. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Memempel, and I'm a second year master's student. I study uh, at the University of Oslo, um, Development, Environment, and Cultural Change at the Center for Development and the Environment. Um, the research I'm going to present today is part of my master thesis, which was started in August. And with that, I'd like to introduce the German Green Belt uh, from separation to unity and beyond the potential of international cooperation for conservation. So I want to start by giving a little bit of context. The European Greenbelt is a strip of protected land uh, spanning 12,500 kilometers across Europe along the line of what used to be the Iron Curtain. 24 countries, including EU and non-EU members, border this line and actively participate in the protection of the biodiversity here. The European Greenbelt is the result of the former German inner border because the area around the wall where people weren't able to interfere um, freely developed. Uh, so there's a high value of biodiversity. And that's the reason conservationists quickly aimed to protect this in 1989 when the wall fell. So the essential foundation of the European Greenbelt is that nature reserves, national parks, and protected areas create an ecological network that connects high value natural and also cultural landscapes. And creating this ecological connectivity is really a fundamental key process to halt landscape fragmentation that threatens biodiversity uh, and its protection everywhere across the world. Um, moving on to my research question that is guiding my research. Uh, how does international cooperation influence the conservation approach of the European Green Belt in Germany? This kind of explains the relevance of my project. There's been a lot of previous research on ecological processes, biological value, and even tourism awareness in Germany. But what's really missing is to see this project from an international perspective. I want to move the conversation from, is this worth protecting, to how can an international community work together? And that's why I look into how this internationality is perceived in Germany. Um, coming to my methodology, I quickly want to give you an overview of my field work. Uh, I started off by going to the Greenbelt, observing the project and the people visiting it. And I chose four main areas that would allow me to cover different German cultures and also different experiences with the inner border. This includes the Baltic Sea in the north, which it's, it's part of the Baltic Greenbelt, but because it's in Germany, I wanted to include this perspective as well. Then along the river Elbe, which is a large UNESCO protected area, the town and region Duderstadt, close to the National Park Harz, and lastly, the town Hof, which is close to the border to the Czech Republic. So along these areas, I conducted semi-structured qualitative interviews to really get perspectives from individuals. And this included four different sample groups, officials, uh, people who work officially with the European Greenbelt, uh, conservationists, so people from national parks, for example, tourists, so this would be people I met while visiting, and lastly, locals, so people who live really close to the border. Overall, I conducted 17 interviews uh, with people between the ages of 22 and 78, so really trying to encompass uh, the different generations as well. Now, I haven't conducted a full analysis of my data, um, but I do want to share what I found most interesting and give you an idea of the concept and topics that come up when discussing the Green Belt in Germany. And I want to share some uh, photos that I took on my field work. So first, of course, is the idea of borders today. You can visit museums and walk along the original wall that is still being kept in some places. And that's a really strange thing to me because the demarcation line was not just this wall, but it was actually a larger zone, you know, a strip of land that you weren't able to access well before the actual border. So to see people uh, able to just walk really close by it and shows that the idea of borders and its importance can drastically change depending on the meaning we give it. Um, there's a term I've come across a couple of times of nature knows no borders, which in some cases is true. 
But then again, nature has been a really large influence on the borders we know today. So this would be rivers or mountains, or in this case, the ocean, which really is a true border. There's no easy way to cross it. And this is something that should be kept in mind, the imagined and the real borders we face today. This is the so-called Dreiländereck, uh, the three country corner, um, which is the meeting of the Czech border with the two German states, Bavaria and Saxony. And this was also a really strange experience because this used to be highly protected. But today you can just walk across, there's no passport controls, there's no surveillance. You can literally just cross into another country or into either Eastern or Western Germany really easily. So with this thought, I just wanna reflect on how borders change and how we attach meaning to them depending on how they are important to us. And I think that this can really provide a vision for the future um, with the Schengen Agreement, we're able to move freely, but there's still a lot of imagined barriers like nationality or today with the coronavirus that shows how quickly the importance changes. Next, I wanna talk about the nature aspect of the former border because we can really see different types of views depending on the experience that people want to have from it today. So here you see the border as part of a museum, which is a culture of remembering, keeping this well kept and maintained because we want to be able to experience it and see how it was and learn from it. Here we see a more free version. Um, the border strip is called Kolonvik. So this was where military would be able to drive and move along the border. And you can find those almost completely intact across Germany. And here, this is part of a hike along the border. There are some memorials for lost lives. And while hiking and relaxing, this is also a part of use of nature around us, um, keeping it and making it accessible. Here though, uh, the grass is growing out of the briggs and generally nature is kind of taking it back its space here. I talked to a conservationist who explained that they tried to remove the path in some areas, but on the one hand, this would cause soil erosion. And on the other hand, this would also be really costly. So it's kind of a question of, do we need to keep it this way? What is its meaning today? And I do wanna mention that it's really uncomfortable to walk on if you're on a long hike along the border, uh, you really do feel this after a couple of minutes. Lastly, I wanna to touch on this internationality and combine it with collective memory, which I've already mentioned before. All along the Greenbelt, you see signs of memory um, and the importance of the fact that we don't have this border anymore. Uh, this is a stone that reads, never separated again, and the date of which the border here was dissolved. This is an art piece that is meant to symbolize the peaceful revolution that led to the fall of the wall. And it includes the flag of the European Union because uh, the artist thought that it was essential to show that international collaboration is what keeps our democracy and our peace as well. So I think that this idea of internationality is really not a new thing for people uh, who grow up to be more Europeans than Germans, um, but this was an important thought 30 years ago as well. This is a sign of which you can see many along the green belt, mostly on the side of roads. And it reads um, here, Germany and Europe were separated until November 10th, 1989, 12.35 AM. And what I think is really interesting is that it says Germany and Europe, uh, showing this awareness of it, not just being a national issue, but a separation between a lot of countries and people um, between these two ideologies. And I think that this is the spirit of the German part of the Green Belt to create a balance between memory and use and creating a vision uh, that is an international future for partners and institutions and locals to work together to protect this landscape on the one hand for the sake of biodiversity, but on the other also for a cultural reason. So this is just a small part of my research that I wanted to share today. I think it fits well into the idea of the IUCN World Conservation Congress that we will be able to participate in in September because it's literally international cooperation that shows how conservation can move forward. Um, the conference focused on landscapes uh, shows that it's necessary to talk about nature and conservation in a cultural matter and realize that societies are attached to it. Um, so I truly hope I will be able to contribute to the conference with my research. And I want to thank the French Institute for this opportunity. Um, thank you for your attention. I look forward to feedback, comments, and a great discussion on this topic. Thank you so much, Annabelle. That's very nice. So our last laureate today is um, uh, from Sweden, 
Justine Ramage, uh, a physical geographer at Nordregia, which is an institute. And uh, Justine works on understanding the impact of climate change on the landscapes and people living in the Arctic. One project investigates how permafrost thawing uh, affects the quality of ecosystem services in the Arctic. And I think Justine will tell us a lot more about this and about uh, weather and um, temperatures in Sweden. It's also cold here and it's been snowing all day, hasn't it, Justine? Yes, hi everyone. Yes, it's a lot of snow. It's very beautiful, although it's dark already. Um, yes, and thank you very much for this opportunity to um, uh, get this award and also to present my research on uh, the impact of permafrost so on subsistence activities in the Arctic. So I'm uh, leaving from, we're leaving from Germany, going back to uh, the Arctic and um, uh, so um, my research focuses on a certain uh, type of um, environment, which is permafrost, um, a ground that is uh, permanently frozen. And uh, I've been uh, investigating um, the link between changes uh, occurring in the environment and the impact on uh, the activities that people have in their environment. I've been working in a I'm working in a EU-funded research project called Nunatariuk, um, which aim is to look at the impact of permafrost so at a global scale. Um, sorry. Permafrost um, is uh, thawing due to increased air temperature in the Arctic. And the most uh, obvious um, uh, consequences of permafrost thaw in the Arctic are on infrastructures. So uh, the ground, when it's frozen, it's stable, but when it starts thawing, it becomes unstable. And that leads to a lot of um, difficulties for the infrastructure. It can crack or um, deform roads or railroad or even uh, airstrips. And it also has impacts on housing. Uh, a lot of housing are um, deforming, even collapsing due to permafrost. So, and all of these have uh, strong consequences on uh, the economy for people living in the Arctic. But there are also um, less uh, visible impact of permafrost, so which are on um, the uh, ecosystems and people health. And this is what I have been focusing on uh, to understand what are the consequences of permafrost so on uh, ecosystem services. And these are actually um, benefits that people get from the nature. So uh, in the Arctic, people are very dependent on their surrounding um, uh, environments. And um, we don't know yet uh, how much permafrost so is impacting uh, their activities. So um, this has been yeah, the focus of, of my uh, latest research. I've been focusing on three communities in the Arctic, uh, one located on Svalbard. Uh, it's called Longyearbyen and has approximately 2,000 inhabitants. Uh, the second uh, community is called Keketaswak, located uh, on the western part of Greenland and has approximately 800 inhabitants. And the third community is called Aklavik and uh, located in uh, the Northwest Territories in Canada. And the, the specificity of these uh, three communities is that they are all three located on continuous permafrost. That means that permafrost is um, uh, surrounding this, uh, that not more than 90% of the landscape around this community is permafrost. And on top, these uh, three communities are coastal communities. So they are both uh, being impacted by changes occurring inland, but also um, uh, on the sea. Um, I used a combination of social science and natural science uh, methodologies. So um, we've been uh, make, developing a, a community survey on subsistence activities, where we had uh, 25 questions um, related to permafrost so like uh, the perception of permafrost so but also uh, the engagement of people in subsistence activities and uh, this uh, survey was available in three languages uh, in uh, in uh, in English uh, Greenlandic and Norwegian 
We had 217 people who took part in the survey, both men, women, and uh, from all ages. And um, also we combined this data that we had uh, with uh, some more natural data uh, on uh, ecosystems and um, trying to uh, link ecosystems with uh, species habitat and look at, looking at the impact of permafrost so on these habitat. So for that, we used um, maps of land covers um, and also we used models of permafrost extent and um, uh, projections of permafrost so um, to 2060. I will now present to you a few results. So from the survey, um, we, we actually highlight that most of the permafrost inhabitants engage in subsistence activities. Um, so uh, they both uh, hunted, fished, but also collected berries and other plants and medicinal um, plants as well. Um, and there were differences between the three communities. In both uh, Canada and Greenland, people were um, more actively engaging in these activities. And contrary, in longer Bien, people were less dependent on these activities and practiced it more, mostly as uh, recreational activities. So this has to do with uh, the background of the communities, uh, because in both communities in Canada and in Greenland, there is um, most of the communities are indigenous uh, with a strong uh, traditional and cultural uh, attachment to the land, while uh, in uh, on Svalbard, uh, the community is mostly composed of um, uh, people coming from the mainland in Norway for a few years uh, to work. So they, do, they don't have the same attachment to the land as uh, in the two other communities. Our study also showed that uh, country food, so the, the food that people obtain from the land, uh, is, in, is essential in the diet of uh, permafrost inhabitants. So people both value country food, they understand that it's uh, healthy for them, but they also consume it regularly. And uh, this is a very important thing because it means that they're also very dependent on the changes occurring in the environment. And I will show you that these are actually ongoing and actually will uh, accelerate. Finally, we also looked at uh, the species that people uh, were depending on, and we showed differences between the three communities. Even though they, are, they were all um, uh, coastal communities, um, uh, the, both communities in Greenland and on Svalbard were more depending on marine resources and therefore less dependent on the changes occurring on the permafrost. Uh, while in Canada, the community uh, is more dependent on uh, species that are uh, terrestrial, mostly caribou, uh, but also moose and uh, rabbits or muskrats or so on. So there they will be more impacted or depended depending on um, the permafrost uh, so. Um, we also uh, looked at the future and looked at the conditions of permafrost and we show that uh, permafrost so uh, will have actually major consequences in the three communities but it will uh, have different consequences because both communities in Greenland and on Svalbard are located in a high arctic climate so uh, permafrost is going to so but not as dramatically as in Aklavik in Canada where actually most of the land uh, will be located in, um, in, uh, in zones that are in high risk of permafrost. So, um, the survey also highlights that uh, the physical changes related to permafrost so are already perceived by the population. Uh, a lot of uh, respondents told us that uh, they observed uh, landslides, an increase in the number of landslides, but also an increase in the uh, coastal erosion that is actually impacting their uh, hunting grounds. And they are losing um, uh, land on which they are actually practicing these um, activities of, um, uh, that are relevant for their subsistence. Um, with that, uh, I think, uh, um, I mean, the, the next step is actually to bring back these uh, results to the communities with which uh, we worked and to discuss the result and to understand their point of view and to understand the way they are actually adapting 
to these changes. And uh, in that sense, it's very um, relevant and important for me to attend the IUCN, where actually there is a, a lot of um, indigenous communities, but also researchers that are participating. And I think it's, it's very uh, valuable to uh, get this discussion ongoing uh, uh, to, to, to understand how uh, research and uh, people, <laughs> researcher and people living in these places that are impacted, so impacted by climate change, can actually work together to uh, better adapt and mitigate these changes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justine. I completely agree. Very important. So thank you for four really interesting presentations. And for sure, there is diversity within biodiversity because you have provided us with uh, quite different perspectives. And now you're joining me in a little panel. We'll see if we can come to a discussion now. And um, those who are attending this webinar have been contributing a few questions now. So I was thinking we will go through them and then we will see if uh, your responses will lead to more questions, possibly. But uh, early on, we had a question from Vanessa, which I think is directed uh, clearly, quite clearly to, to Julie. Uh, Vanessa is asking if you can detail uh, regarding frog cell line. Is the frog cell line available at the moment? Hi, yes, and of course I can answer that. Um, so there's um, not a lot, but there is uh, cell lines from various uh, amphibian species. Uh, we managed to establish quite a few uh, from various species during this project as well. And um, San Diego Frozen Zoo, which is one of the largest uh, biobanks which conserve uh, genetic diversity from animals. They have uh, around 100 different species uh, of amphibians where they do have cell lines from, from all of them. So, so they, are, they are existing, uh, but it's a very, very low percentage of uh, all known amphibians. So we do not have a lot of information um, from amphibians because we have so few cell lines. Great, right. We'll see if Vanessa is happy with that or she will ask you another question. Now, um, Helena has a question here. How do rare metals affect the biodiversity and geodiversity? What are the problems of technology improvement for geodiversity? So in, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, actually the metallurgy question is quite important because one of the advantages of using geodiversity as a measure of the diversity of the whole nature is that it is so much easier to measure. Uh, if you want to know a biodiversity of a site, you most probably have to go there and uh, search the species and do the field work and so on. But um, geodiversity is uh, uh, although I presented to you the local scale methodology we are um, developing that can be um, done at the site level, but uh, geodiversity can also be detected on landscape scale from uh, geographic information system sources. So on computer data sets and it's much easier to gain and it actually saves a lot of money when compared to the field work. So. Right. Uh, in that case, I would say that um, the advances in technology are uh, really, or they support the use of geodiversity measures in nature conservation. We also have uh, Simo here asking about that term geodiversity versus biotypes. For example, he says we take cows out to certain areas so that they change the area back to the biotype, what it used to be. Historically, yeah. Is biotype a certain kind of stage in geodiversity methodology? So if I continue, uh, the term biotype is not that familiar for me, but uh, I think it's more related to community ecology than the actual geodiversity term. But I might be wrong in here also. Mm -hmm. We'll see, but Simo is very interested generally. He has more questions to us here. One is about biobanking. Can you see that biobanks could be used to really reproducing species after they're being extinct? 
So thank you for that question. I guess that's definitely for me. Um, so it is possible uh, because you can conserve germplasm from both males and females from most species. Uh, of course, it's not all the te technologies that works um, so far. But however, it's not the purpose with this type of um, conservation. Um, so biobanking is a conservation tool that meant, that's meant to be supplementary. So it's still extremely important that we conserve the natural habitats and the general uh, conservation strategies that we know of. Um, but with biobanking, it is possible to conserve uh, the gen genetic diversity before it goes extinct. And that's definitely uh, the main purpose of this type of uh, supplementary conservation. Um, it's a supplementary uh, conservation tool, I would definitely say. But yes, it is possible, but it is not the main purpose of this type of, of conservation. Mm. And Simo is also asking, uh, Justine, uh, relating to the large permafrost areas in Siberia and Russia, if you have collaboration with Russian scientists uh, regarding this. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Simo. Um, yes, I mean, Russia is uh, one of the <laughs> Uh, largest country with permafrost, so it's very important to work with uh, Russian scientists. So in the project I'm working with, uh, we are working, collaborating with Russian scientists and working mostly in Siberia. Um, the survey that we did was um, initially supposed to also uh, take place in uh, in Siberia, in Yakutsk and uh, in, in the in one of the town close to the, the shore. But the, the difficulty here is that um, it's even in the other communities, it's very difficult to um, access these communities. They are very remote. Uh, and it's also very difficult to access the communities, not in terms of transportation, but in terms of um, communication and, and, and link to the people. So uh, to be able to, to work in, in these remote communities, you need to have um, to establish a link uh, with the people because they won't necessarily you know answer your questions like that not knowing who you are and um, unfortunately in the time that we had with the project we did not manage to to create this uh, strong link and uh, we didn't collect enough answers from uh, the inhabitant to be able to process them and look at uh, all the statistics but yes in general yes we are co collaborating with russian scientists great and a question for Helena here. Uh, rare metals are used excessively in technology. So is there a concern from the disappearing from, uh, from the soil? How to conserve this better? It's always a good question to ask that, uh, how to conserve something better. And I don't have a direct answer to how, conserve, how to conserve soil better, but I think that with collaboration and the possibility that uh, scientists can use even global data set today, uh, it is possible to make better conservation plans. Hmm. Now we have a question from Vincent, who is asking uh, uh, Julie, genetic diversity is important, but is avoidance of inbreeding taken into consideration? Uh, for example, a sample many individuals to avoid Oh, I don't know what this word means. Consanguinity. Someone has to help me with that. Thank you. That's a very interesting Sanguine. question. Um, and and yes, definitely, um, inbreeding uh, concerns are taking into account when uh, working with uh, biobanking. Um, so we do focus on sampling as many uh, individuals as possible. We do a lot of post-mortem samples, um, which makes it possible for us to get a lot of uh, samples from very, uh, from uh, a lot of different individuals. Um, for us, it's extremely important as well, because we're interested in the differences within a species as well. And, and some of the research I've um, conducted has also shown that we do see a, a variety within um, a species when it comes to, to cell lines. 
So these cell lines, they might not grow exactly uh, in the same pattern or at the same speed or have the same uh, cell proliferation, which is very, very interesting. So yes, uh, we do take it into account and it is an extremely important um, mention, especially if it's combined with reproductive um, or assisted reproductive technologies, of course. Um, it is very, very important. And here we have someone asking a difficult question and being aware of that he's raising the, the discussion now to a level of circular economy, which of course is very, very valid in, uh, in today's day and age. So he's asking, um, well, he's saying we're looking at a starting a study on how circular economy solutions could help halt biodiversity loss looking at e.g. food and agriculture sector. Do you think it's possible to quantify this potential relationship or do you know of any studies or methodologies that relate to this? I mean, I could almost step in there from the perspective of research relating to cities, but uh, you work more uh, with other uh, approaches. And I think, um, I think we should hear how you, um, um, how you are uh, thinking about circular economy perspectives. Who would like to answer? Yeah, I can go ahead and maybe offer <laughs> a point to that. Um, I think that generally a circular economy is definitely um, really important and interesting for personal consumption. Um, but for biodiversity, I think agriculture and land use is definitely a really important key point. So if there was a way to um, increase circular economy in agriculture and ensure that uh, the land use is somehow being, you know, uh, modified so that there is going to be less waste or less wasted space and less wasted landscape. Um, that would definitely be very interesting to see. Um, but I do see a lot of other issues that uh, would come into that place because I relate circular economy to be a lot more about personal consumption. Yeah, but it's linking also different research fields together, usually with new business models and something like the potential of reducing transport, which might affect also biodiversity in, a, in, in an agricultural setting or so. But uh, yes, complex. Uh, who else wants to comment on this? I wish we could have ev all the participants uh, joining in, but we will have to make do with us here. I will ship in with a question myself, uh, which connects partly to, to this. Um, um, when I work with uh, climate transition uh, relating to cities, um, the, our research very strongly is linked to, of course, citizens and, and you were onto personal consumption, but behavior issues, et cetera, are very important. And, but citizen science and um, engagement from uh, the civil society in uh, data collection or in using uh, various technologies is actually becoming quite, um, uh, quite relevant in, where, in this area. So I'm curious to hear if um, in the or how you see uh, citizens contributions uh, to biodiversity. Um, have you come across that in your in your work um, so far? If I can have the turn to say something so um we are not, uh, in our research, we are not looking for uh, people's reactions, uh, but we have been, um, or I would like to notice people that uh, the abiotic nature offers us many goods. Like if you have a mobile phone, it includes like tens of minerals that are produced by the abiotic nature. And people don't often think that actually for instance, your phone is produced from stuff from rocks. So uh, people might nowadays think of biodiversity and because it's uh, or the biodiversity loss, but they should also think that the whole nature is kind of we are we are using the whole nature for for our own good, and mm -hmm. we should think that. Too. Yeah. So we come back to the circular. Uh... Uh, approaches, uh, hopefully, at some point. Um, we have some more questions. Um, 
Could there be difficulties rehabilitating old species samples and make, letting them adapt to future conditions? Um, Julie, or anyone, I guess. Yeah, I can, I can start giving it a go. Um, so if it's specifically biobanking we're talking about, um, it's very important that it's not a static biobank, but that the samples are renewed and used um, throughout the time because, um, because we do get a problem with adaptations if we only have old samples, which we are planning to use for, for example, artificial insemination or, or other techniques. So it is very important that these samples are renewed so that they follow um, the different climate changes, different adaptations species might have to specific environments as well. That's good. And now a question on the pandemic, of course, which affects everything, but also allows certain things to happen, like bringing us together like this. Um, could you feel this year that the pandemic made the cause of biodiversity a more important and recognized issue? So for me, yeah, <laughs> this is really interesting because I conducted my field work in October last year, and this was during the fall break in Germany. Um, and there's been such an enormous increase in tourists that, you know, go to their backyard and see what's there and they don't have the opportunity to travel somewhere else. So they look at their home country and um, a lot of these protected areas or national parks that you could visit um, barely had the capacity for this because there was this enormous storm of people. Um, but this also um, leads to thinking about, okay, well, do we actually know our own countries and our own natures before traveling somewhere else. So um, finding this balance between going somewhere else, but also providing the accessibility to being able to enjoy uh, nature at home and what this means for the capacity for the protected areas um, is definitely an issue that has come up. Right. Now we're getting a question whether us staying at home is the reason why there is more snowing. Maybe this is a little bit of a trigger to something, I don't know. Can we comment on this? I was thinking that maybe you have um, uh, comments to each other. Is this the first time um, that you have come across each other's work or uh, do you actually know of each other from uh, literature or from uh, joining conferences, etc.? I think we come from uh, various fields, even though we have connections. Uh, uh, yeah, I see. Uh, I, I haven't come across uh, other laureates, but uh, I guess we will have the opportunity in the future. I mean, in, in September, mostly. Yeah, that's great. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, um, does any of you want to make a final remark or a comment on uh, your expectations? Again, you've shared a lot about what you're hoping for going to Marseille. And it's clear that it will be an opportunity uh, to meet people, but also maybe to, um, yeah, to make a step forward and to, to make actions more visible. And uh, do you have anything like strong you would like to address as a message that you think is really important? Because now, especially if we don't know if we can go to Marseille, it may be important to actually work in advance and, and therefore to start formulating uh, what the important issues are that should be on the table and not wait for it for the actual day. So based on, on today's discussion, is there something you would like to say to the organizers or uh, to the institutes uh, to communicate? Or maybe someone in the in in the Q and A wants to give us a suggestion of things that need to be pushed in the European Community between so now and September. I think for me, what's really important is that um, institutions such as the IUCN and the people who attend conferences like this um, really think about the issues we have on different scales. Because a lot of the times we have these goals, like, um, you know, I went into my research thinking that internationality is a, a, a really important goal to have, which it is. 
but it is different for different scales. It's different on a local level than it is on a national or even an international level. And I think that we need to make sure that we approach issues on different scales, depending on the communities that we want them to serve. And I think that that can sometimes get lost on conferences that are really big and really important and international to think about, um, you know, who are the communities that we're bringing this research to? And I thought that this was also a really interesting point Justine made about bringing the result back to uh, where we got them from, where we got the data from. That's a very good point. I also think that this kind of uh, networking that the French institutes are, are promoting uh, by engaging researchers in, in a discussion between the countries is a really good supplement of the actual conferences. Uh, because we can't just travel to conferences or write our papers, we need to find other other ways uh, ahead. So I think with this, it's a good opportunity now to start rounding up um, to close this webinar, thanking you for your contributions, which were really great, I think. I want to thank you very much for um, sharing your work with us today. And on behalf of um, the French, the four French institutes and AFSR um, really also thank all the participants that join us today and to tell everyone, stay close now to your French institutes uh, and to AFSR. There will be funding opportunities and other awards and not least this kind of networking activities and events. So hopefully we meet again in the French Nordic Zoomiverse very soon and um, you will find all the contacts you need to uh, to the presenters today through your um, uh, French Institute websites. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you everyone working in the background and communicating um, this event online. So enjoy the snowing and enjoy the winter times as well as you can. Take it easy out there. Thank you.